Well, to kick things off tonight, we're going to uh, take a moment to marvel over one particular event in ancient history. Well, not really that ancient, uh, maybe ancient for us because it was 600 some years ago. I want to talk about the invention of the printing press. <laughs> the printing press. The world's first printing press with movable metal type is invented in A.D. 1455 in Mainz, Germany by Johann Gutenberg. This invention is perhaps the single most important event to influence the spread of the gospel. Yes, praise God for the printing press. The ability to mass produce Bible translations is a godsend. And the way that I look at the massive influx of printed Bibles is that by doing that, that is in and of itself an act of obedience to God's word. On the one hand, there's a lot to criticize about modern technological advancements. But the flip side is, is that we have the ability to make the Bible more accessible to more people, and that's exactly what God wants us to use our technology for. Now, I don't know if, if Johann Gutenberg had this in his thinking at any point when he invented his printing machine, <clears throat> but the accelerated ability to produce Bibles perfectly fulfills God's intention for replicating his word. And what I'd like to do to kick things off tonight is to sh show us two sections of scripture that substantiate this. I'd like us to go to Deuteronomy chapter six. We're gonna go to Deuteronomy six and look at a few verses there, and then we're gonna go to Deuteronomy 11 and look at a few verses there. Deuteronomy chapter 6. You probably know at least this first set of passages very, very well. Deuteronomy 6. And we're going to start reading <clears throat> at verse 4. We know this as the Shema, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall walk, excuse me, talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Publish them. Publish them is what that's saying. Publish it. Put it everywhere. Write it all over the place. Now look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. Similar. Similar command, a little bit more detailed. God is very concerned that we understand him, who he is. God is very concerned that we understand what his commandments are. God is very concerned that we obey him. And one of the things that aids in the facilitation of obeying him is by having his word accessible to us in any form. Look at chapter 11, verse 16. Beware that your hearts are not deceived and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them. Or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the ground will not yield its fruit and you will perish quickly from the good land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall therefore impress these words of mine on your heart and on your soul. 
And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Same thing, right, as in, as in six? But, hold on. And you shall teach them to your sons, talking of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. In other words, they're to be the talk of your life. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that your days and the days of your sons may be multiplied on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens remain above the earth. Let me suggest to you that printing out Bibles and putting them into the hands of people fulfills this command. Do you agree? It fulfills this command. It helps to spread the seed of God's word. Translations. Translations help to fulfill this. Let's talk about translations. Let's look at the subject of translations. First of all, we're going to talk about the background of Bible translations. There is a difference between the manuscripts of the Bible, which are written in Hebrew and Greek, and translations of the Bible. This all needs to be made clear so that people can have an accurate understanding of Bible translations. When we speak of the originals, the autographs, we are speaking of the actual writings of the Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles. None of these originals exist any longer. We've already talked about that. When we speak of manuscripts, we are usually speaking of Hebrew and Greek copies, of which there are thousands in existence. When we speak of translations, we are referring to translations of the Hebrew and Greek texts or manuscripts into any number of languages. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. We've already talked about that, with a few sections of Daniel penned in Aramaic. Copies of the Hebrew text are called Old Testament manuscripts. Translations of the Hebrew text are called Old Testament versions. As far as we know, all translations are made from Hebrew copies or from copies compiled from various copies, not from the original text or autographs. And we understand that. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. Copies of the Greek text are called New Testament manuscripts. Translations of the Greek text are called New Testament versions. As far as we know, all trans Translations of the New Testament were made from Greek manuscripts or from editions compiled from various Greek manuscripts, not from the original texts or autographs themselves. The English Bible we hold in our hands, in whatever translation has, <clears throat> we hold in our hands in whatever translation, has gone through quite a process. Let us imagine that we are reading the Gospel of Luke. The physician Luke wrote this Gospel in Greek, his native tongue, around A.D. 60. Luke's original, the autograph, no longer exists. Copies, manuscripts of Luke's Gospel, must have been shortly made after he produced his original work, and copies were made for hundreds of years thereafter. We have hundreds and hundreds of manuscript copies of the Gospel of Luke. A few of them date to a hundred or so years after the time he wrote the original. We have actually thousands of copies of Luke. There are many more from the third century, even more from the fourth century and so on. In due course, scholars have studied these manuscripts, decided which ones were the best, and then compiled editions of the Greek text. Most English Bible translators use these editions to make their English translations. 
but some have translated straight from a particular manuscript or used only a limited number of Greek manuscripts. Now check this out. So as we read the Gospel of Luke in English, we should realize that we are reading a translation of a copy or copies of the original text. Several people have been at work to make that original text accessible to us. First, there's Luke the writer who produced the autograph. Scribes who produced copies upon copies of this work. Archaeologists who discovered these copies. Paleographers who provided transcriptions of these copies. Textual critics who compared the copies and compiled critical editions of the Greek text. And translators who produced English renderings of the Greek text. There's a lot that went into getting us our Bible, folks. A lot. Now imagine if we were in the, let's say we were in 150 AD. <clears throat> Somebody may have had the original copy of Luke, maybe, at that time. We don't know. But let's just say that many, many copies of the Gospel of Luke went out. Many. Dozens and dozens. People are copying them all, copying them all over the place. <clears throat> Somebody gets a copy. And they look at it and think, huh, that's interesting. And then another copy arrives in town. W wouldn't it make sense they would compare them? Wouldn't it make sense thinking, hmm, there's a few differences there. I wonder why that is. They get on the phone. No, they don't do that, right? They send someone over to the next town. Do you guys got any copies of Luke over there? Yeah, we've got five of them. Hey, do you mind if we compare our copies with yours? Of course they're going to do it this way. They don't have email. They don't have copy machines. They didn't, Gutenberg hadn't invented the printed, printing press yet. So they're going to take these handheld, the, these handwritten copies to make comparisons. See, that's why it shouldn't be so strange to us that we, in manuscripts, we find issues and transcribal uh, emendations. And we shouldn't be su surprised at, it, at that at all. These things were handwritten. Sit down and write out, take, your, take a NASB, take an NIV, take a King James, sit down one afternoon and write out the entire Bible by hand and see how long it would take you. I know some people that have done it. They did it just as a project. <clears throat> write out the entire Bible, right? <clears throat> and then have somebody else check your work and see if there's any dis discrepancies there, see if there's any inaccuracies there. So just we understand this, this process. We're so, we're so dialed in on the way we do things today. So much work went into getting us this book. And we should be positively blown away by the process, by the amount of time that it took to get this Bible into our hands. One more slide here. Those who choose to criticize a translation must look at the original language and then make a judgment about whether or not a translation faithfully renders the meaning of the best text found in the best manuscripts. Various scribes making copies of the Hebrew scriptures or Greek scriptures made many alterations to the text, especially the monks in the Middle Ages. It has been the job of textual critics ever since to sort through these changes and provide translators with a reconstructed text. That's exactly what every Bible translator in the world today, no matter what country you're in, they start with a Hebrew manuscript and a Greek manuscript, or excuse me, a Greek text. 99.99% .99 of the time they start out with a critical edition of a Hebrew text or a Greek text, and then proceed to translate it into whatever language that is. They have available to them critical editions. We'll look at this later on, but they'll, I'll give it to you in a nutshell. Critical editions, which have all of the variations of the manuscript right there in the copy of the, of the Greek text they're looking at. 
And so in, in, in many ways, translators today have way more available to them in order to make a copy of a Bible. Much more available to them. Now, we should also talk about, since we're talking about translations, let's talk about theories of translations. Introduction here to translation theory, form and function. Think about the way you're going to translate something. Okay? So let's consider this. Once an appropriate base text is established, including if and how to represent textual variation within a translation, issues related to how the original, <clears throat> the original or source language, in other words, the language that a text is translated from, is best transferred into the receptor language. The language that a text is translated in, into must be addressed. So in other words, you've got the source text and you're taking the source text and you're translating that into a text, a receptor text, someone who's going to be getting that Bible. Okay, so what are some theories involved in that? Some theories focus more on rendering the form of the text in translation while others focus more on rendering its function. What do we mean? Well, there are two basic theories and or methodologies of Bible translation. The first is called formal equivalence. According to this theory, the translator attempts to render the exact words, hence the word formal, meaning form for form, the exact words of the original language into the receptor language. This kind of translation is commonly known as literal translation. Others call it word for word translation. Okay? So you've got formal equivalence, also known as literal translation or word for word translation. The second kind of translation has been called dynamic equivalence or functional equivalence by the theory, translation theorist Eugene Nita. Mr. Nita has defined the ideal of translation as the reproduction in a receptor language of the closest natural equivalent of the source language message. First in terms of meaning and second in terms of style. Nita therefore believes that a translation should have the same dynamic impact upon readers as the original had upon its audience. So in other words, if you're translating a Bible and you're using a Hebrew idiom and the, recept the receivers of that translation wouldn't understand a Hebrew idiom, you might, as a translator, translate it into an idiom that that language would understand. Does that make sense? Okay. Dynamic equivalence is therefore to be defined in terms of the degree to which the receptors of the message in the receptor language respond to it in substantially the same manner as the receptors in the source language. Does that make sense? Receiving versus the one giving out or translating. This response can never be identical for the cultural and historical settings are too different. But there should be a high degree of equivalence of response or the translation will have failed to accomplish its purpose. Nita's theory of dynamic equivalence has become a standard or ideal that many modern translators have attempted to attain. Another way of speaking about a functionally equivalent translation is to call it a thought-for-thought -thought translation as opposed to a word-for-word -word translation. I suppose in some way you could say it's paraphrasing it, but that's a different thing, and we'll talk about that later. Of course, to translate the thought 
of the original languages requires that the text be interpreted accurately and then rendered in an understandable idiom. Figure of speech. You know, an idiom, a figure of speech. Thus, the goal of any functionally equivalent translation is for it to be exegetically accurate and idiomatically powerful. In other words, you don't want to take away from the original because you're trying to make the one receiving this translation understand it. And that can happen sometimes. Sometimes the punch is lessened because you're trying to make it really relate to the person that you're translating it for. That's, one of the, that's just one of the things translators have to deal with. They have to grapple with this. Now, I'm getting my, ahead of myself a little bit here, but two uh, very popular examples of formal equivalence versus dynamic equivalence would be the NASB. The NASB would be an example, the New American Standard Bible would be an example of a formal equivalent translation. The NIV would be a good example of a dynamic equivalent translation. We'll get into the specifics of those probably not till next week. <laughs> okay, so continuing on. So a good translation must be reliable and readable. That is, it must reliably replicate the meaning of the text without sacrificing its readability. At various points in the scriptures, there is evidence that the Bible documents were written to be read aloud, usually in public worship. Undoubtedly, those ancient hearers of the word understood the message as it was delivered to them. Any translation should be just as fluent and intelligible to a modern audience. Now, this of course does not mean that translation can replace interpretation of difficult passages. As in the case of the eunuch who needed Philip's interpretation of Isaiah 53. But a good rendering minimizes the need for unnecessary interpretation or, parentheses there, exegesis, which is a technical term that means drawing out the meaning of the text. Ever since the time of Jerome, who produced the translation known as the Latin Vulgate, there has been debate over what is the best method to translate the Bible, the word-for-word -word approach or the thought-for-thought -thought approach, or thought-for-thought -thought or sense-for-sense -sense approach. When it came to translating scriptures, Jerome, contrary to his normal pra practice, felt the compulsion to render word for word, but he did not always do so in the Vulgate. Now, Martin Luther, the great reformer and translator of the German Bible, believed that a translator's paramount task was to reproduce the spirit of the author. At times, this could only be accomplished by an idiomatic rendering, though when the original required it, word for word was to be used. Other translators have preferred to be very literal because they have feared that in translating on a thought for thought basis, they might alter the text according to their own subjective interpretation, and that is true. Indeed, it is true that a word-for-word -word rendering can be executed more easily than a thought-for-thought -thought one. In doing the latter, the translator must enter into the same thought as the author, and who can always know with certainty what the author's original intended meaning was? Therefore, a functionally equivalent or thought-for-thought -thought translation should be done by a group of scholars who employ the best exegetical tools. And it says there in parentheses to guard against any personal subjectivism. And that certainly could be the case. Case in point is this new passion translation. Bad translation, I wouldn't even use it. But that's a perfect example of a very subjective translation of the Bible. I won't go into that now, but so. <clears throat> That's something to think about when we're talking about translations. 
<clears throat> we'd like to think that everything could be translated literally, but when we're trying to think about how we're going to translate something for somebody in another language, we have to think about, well, how are they going to be able to understand this? There's a lot that goes into this. Now, before we delve more into some specifics about our modern English translations, I thought it would be very helpful for us to review the history of the English Bible. The English Bible has quite an amazing history. First of all, history of the English Bible. There are two major phases of Bible translation in the history of the English Bible. The first phase is marked by the rise of vernacular translations or popular translations that in many ways supported the efforts of the Protestant Reformation, which included William Tyndale, Miles Coverdale, Thomas Matthew, uh, the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, and the Bishop's Bible. These English versions were used in various ways, especially Tyndale's, in the translation of the authorized or King James Version of the Bible in 1611. Due to numerous excellent qualities, its strong support and its heavy reliance upon the remarkable translational work of Tyndale, the AV, authorized version, became the translation that dominated this first phase of the English Bible's history. The second major turning point is marked by the rise of modern English versions beginning around the end of the 19th century with the English Revised Version and the American Standard Version. And so that's, you know, things sort of kicked off in the 19th century that began what we call the modern English Version era. We've had a lot of Bible versions that have come out over the last 100 years, man, I don't even know how many, maybe 100, I don't know, maybe more than that. But um, I thought what would be an interesting exercise, what I thought would be beneficial tonight, is for us to sort of do a, a drive-by style review of the English Bible's history leading up to the modern translations that we are so familiar with today. Because we've only mentioned the King James ber Version, but... Uh, there's a lot of other things that went behind that went into, I should say, the making of what we now have today as the English Bible. So let's do a real quick, and boy, we're going we're gonna to rocket through this. You guys ready to rocket through some slides here? Well, we're about to, all right? So let's just, uh, let's go on a real quick journey here, all righty? Let's go all the way back to 1300 A.D., before the printing press is invented, the Bible is copied by hand very accurately. In many cases, it is copied by special scribes who developed intricate methods of counting words <clears throat> to ensure that no errors are made. And we talked about that a while back. The first English Bible is translated from Latin <clears throat> in A.D. 1382. It is called the Wycliffe Bible in honor of priest and Oxford scholar John Wycliffe. During his lifetime, Wycliffe had wanted common people to have the Bible. He also criticized a number of church practices and policies. And so Wycliffe, his followers derisively called <coughs> lollards, meaning mumblers, included Wycliffe's criticism in the preface to the Wycliffe Bible. Most of you, how many of you ever heard of the Wycliffe Bible? Anybody? Okay, probably a lot of you here. In 1408 in England, it becomes illegal to translate or read the Bible in common English language without permission from a bishop. We don't even understand half of the struggles that people went through just to obtain a Bible, let alone to have a Bible like, you know, to the degree that we do today. In 1415, the Wycliffe Bible is banned and burned. Forty years later, Wy after Wycliffe's death, in A.D. 1428, his bones are exhumed and burned for heresy. <clears throat> Boy, they really hated this Wycliffe and his Bible. Then, as we already discussed, the world's first printing press with movable metal type is invented in A.D. 14. 
55 in Mainz, Germany by Johann Gutenberg. The Gutenberg Bible is the first book ever printed with the printing press. This Latin Vulgate version is often illuminated by artists who hand-painted letters and ornaments on each page. Very elaborate. Remember, we looked at a lot of those uh, copies of that back when we were looking at uh, <coughs> manuscripts. Erasmus, Desiderius Erasmus, a priest and Greek scholar, publishes a new Greek edition and a more accurate Latin translation of the New Testament in A.D. 1516. Erasmus's goal was that everyone be able to read the Bible from the farmer in the field to the weaver at the loom. His Greek text forms the basis of the Textus Receptus or received text. The Textus Receptus is later used by Martin Luther, William Tyndale, and the King James translators. Martin Luther translates the New Testament into German in A.D. 1522. Anybody ever seen the movie Luther that came out, I think, in 2007? Excellent movie. Excellent movie. I would encourage you to watch it. William Tyndale, priest and Oxford scholar, translates the New Testament from Greek into English, but cannot get approval to publish it in England. So he moves to Germany and prints Bibles, smuggling, smuggling them into England in sacks of corn and flour. In A.D. 1535, he publishes part of the Old Testament translated from Hebrew into English. The Coverdale Bible is translated by Miles Cover Coverdale in 1535 and dedicated to Anne Boleyn, one of King Henry VIII's wives, this is the first complete Bible to be printed in English. There's a picture of it, the front cover of it. In 15, AD 1536, Tyndale is strangled and burned at the stake. His final words are, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Tyndale is called the father of the English Bible because his translation forms the basis of the King James Version. Much of the style and vocabulary we know as biblical English is traceable to his work. We owe much, obviously, to William Tyndale. The Matthews Bible is translated by John Rogers under the pen name Thomas Matthew and is the first Bible published with the king's permission. Printed just one year after Tyndale's death, Matthew's New Testament relies heavily on Tyndale's version. As a tribute to him on the last page of the Old Testament, Tyndale's initials are printed in two and a half inch block letters like that. Later, Thomas Cromwell, advisor to King Henry VIII, entrusts Coverdale to revise Matthew's Bible to make what they called the Great Bible. I think all Bibles are great, but <clears throat> this one's called the Great Bible. <clears throat> in 1539, the Great Bible, you got to say it that way, is placed in every church by order of Thomas Kramer, Archbishop under King Henry VIII. It is read aloud except during, <clears throat> uh, it is read aloud except during services and sermons. The Bible is chained to the church pillars to discourage theft. How about that? England's Queen Mary bans Protestant translations of the English Bible. John Rogers and Thomas Kramer are burned at the stake. Later, some 300 men, women, and children are also burned. Exiles from England flee to Geneva, Switzerland. In A.D. 1560, they print the Geneva Bible, which is a complete revision of the Great Bible with the Old Testament translated from Hebrew. The Geneva Bible contains the trans or theological notes from Protestant scholars John Calvin, Theodore Beza, John Knox, and Whittingham. It is the first Bible to use Roman type. 
This is the Bible of Shakespeare and the one carried to America by the pilgrims in A.D. 1620. The A.D. 1640 edition is the first English Bible to omit the Apocrypha. We've already talked about the Apocrypha. The translation of the Bishop's Bible begins under Queen Elizabeth in A.D. 1568. It is translated by several bishops of the Church of England in answer to the Geneva Bible. Can't let that Geneva Bible outdo the English. The English must have their own Bible. The Reims Douay Bible is translated into English from the Latin Vulgate by Catholic scholar Gregory Martin while in exile in France. It becomes the standard translation for the Catholic Church. King James I commissions 54 scholars to undertake a new Bible translation. For six years, six teams of scholars using the Texas Receptus, <clears throat> Bishop's Bible and Tyndale's Bible complete the new version in A.D. 1611. The King James Version is also called the Authorized Version. It uses the best known manuscripts available at the time and it is revised several times. Between A.D. 1629 and A.D. 1947, several, several of the earliest known copies of the Bible are found. Remember we talked about Codex Alexand Alexandrinus, a copy of the New Testament from A.D. 400 is perhaps the best copy of the book of Revelation. It is made available to Western scholars in A.D. 1629. We already talked about that. The King James edition used today is last revised in A.D. 1769. However, it does not make use of any recently discovered manuscripts including Codex Alexandrinus. It is the most popular Bible for more than 300 years. Then, of course, we talked about the discovery of Codex Sinaiticus, earliest complete copy of the New Testament copied in A.D. 350. Remember, that was found in St. Catherine's Monastery. <clears throat> it was discovered at Mount Sinai in A.D. 16, or excuse me, 1859. Remember that guy, Constantine von Tisendorf, discovered that. Then in A.D. 1870, scholars in England decided to revise the King James Version to reflect the findings from the manuscripts discovered from the two previous centuries. Codex Vaticanus is released to scholars in 1889 by the Vatican Library. It is the earliest known and probably best copy known of the New Testament at this time. Probably the copy dates back to 325 A.D. We've already talked about that. Then, of course, there was the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 by that shepherd, and they contained the oldest known copies of portions of the Old Testament. These copies were made between 250 B.C. and 100 A.D. Amazing. The copies of Isaiah, <coughs> discovered in the Qumran Caves, the Dead Sea Scrolls, proved, proved to be remarkably close to the standard Hebrew Bible varying slightly in the spelling of some names. They give overwhelming confirmation of the reliability of the Masoretic copies. Remember the Masoretes, we talked about those guys, those famous copyists. All in all, the discovery of these ancient, ancient Hebrew and Greek manuscripts proves beyond all doubt that our English text was translated with amazing accuracy. But as you can see, there's been Many, many different renditions of the English text. Interestingly, some of them were made for political reasons. Can't let this country, you know, get one up on our country, so we've got to make our own translation. You know, today Bible translations are still made um, with less than, noble, uh, less than noble influence behind them. Sometimes it's just money. Sometimes it is a money thing. We have plenty of English translations right now. We don't need any more English translations. But we do have some good English translations. 
And uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about some of the English translations, <clears throat> which translation method they used, some of the strengths, some of the weaknesses of the different translations that we have uh, available to us today. And then we'll also talk about critical editions of the Greek New Testament, um, which are just an amazing development in the translation process. Some of the, some of the greatest tools that we have accessible to us today. We'll talk about that. Alrighty? I told you that I was going to buzz through that as quick as I could. <clears throat> but just so you can see from that, to the, the English Bible, I mean, you know, it goes back 600 years, 600 plus years, and uh, has a tremendous history behind it. And we, the United States, uh, many, there have been many Greek scholars that have been raised up through the ranks through, for the last 150, 200 years, Greek scholars that have done remarkable jobs at translating manuscripts into, uh, into Greek and Hebrew texts. And then that has made it possible for translation teams from the United States to go into other countries and help to translate Bibles in other countries in their language. God's getting his word out. Fulfilling the Great Commission. Amazing. Awesome. And you know what? God gives that command that we read in Deuteronomy. He gave that command to his people. God didn't say, I'm going to provide you with copies of this. God didn't say, I'm going to just keep putting out them, those stone tablets for you guys. I've got 25,000 stone tablets right here. He, it come, each of you, grab a copy and take it back to your, your place of residence. No, the Lord said, I've given this to you. I've verbally given you the, these commands. Write it down. And it better be accurate because it's my word. It better be accurate. God put that responsibility on us. Isn't that amazing that he would do that? Amazing. Let's stand. Let's close. The glorious history of our English Bible. We talked about the glorious history of every other, of the originals. But now let's, it's time to get down to the nitty gritty of this Bible right here and how God, God got this thing into our hands. Aren't you grateful that you have a copy of the Bible today? Amen. Maybe you have more than one. Maybe you have 10. And we can compare how accountable we are. But how wonderful it is that we have this accessible to us. You know, as deception abounds, God just makes his word more available. We know that deception is abounding. <clears throat> we know that evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We know that sin is going to reach a zenith in the world. Deception is going to reach a zenith. But corresponding to that, God says, I'm making my truth available, readily available. Thank God for that.